Thank you very much, Gina, for the introduction. I'd first like to welcome you. Good morning to all of you. I'm very grateful for the daily Junge Welt. This is the 29th International Rosa Luxemburg Conference. And I'm grateful that we have our information booth and that I have the opportunity to speak to you. Dear comrades, the war in Ukraine, the killing of Palestinians in Gaza, the embargo against Cuba are present in many discussions today. What is less present, though, is that in Africa there is still a colony, the last colony in Africa, and I'm talking about Western Sahara. And I wanted to talk about Western Sahara. I'd like to give you an update. I want to talk about the people in Sahara and their fight for independence and sovereignty. The Western Sahara is the last colony in Sahara. It's situated at the coast of the Atlantic. It has a border with Morocco, with Algeria, and in the east and south, it has a border with Mauritania. After the Berlin Conference of 1884, in which Africa was distributed amongst the European powers like a piece of cake, Western Sahara was declared to be a Spanish protectorate, and it was given the name Spanish Sahara. In December 1963, then, the United Nations declared Western Sahara to a uh, um, self-governed area. And after years of peaceful resistance against the Spanish presence, the Frente Polisario was established in 1973 as a liberation movement for Western Sahara. For West Sahara. The people in Western Sahara is being represented by the Frente Polisario. As a result of the pressure of the United Nations and military and military actions of Polisario, in 1974, Spain, Spain declared its willingness and intention to carry out a public vote on the self-governing of Western Sahara in 1975. Morocco and Mauritania rejected that wish, and they applied and turned to the International Court of Justice and wanted to have a ruling on the colonial status of the territory. And after shortly before the International Court of Justice was meant to give its written opinion where they expressed their support for the decolonization of Western Sahara, the king in Mauritania ordered the Green March. The Green March was the first step which led to the invasion of Mar Mauritania, of, of Western Sahara, through Morocco. It led uh, to the war between the Morocco Mauritanian army and the Frente Polisario, the liberation movement. Mauritania, in 1979, withdrew from Western Sahara and left its part to Morocco. In the early 1980s, Morocco started to build a 
started to build a wall which separated Western Sahara into two parts. It separated the Moroccan part from the rest of the country. And the kingdom was meant to secure its part of the territory. The Morocco owner of Western Sahara occupied power of Morocco forced large part of the population to free the, flee the country and to shelter in Western Algeria, where they built their refugee camps close to the city of Tindif. And in these refugee camps, I was born, I was raised, went to school there, and I still live there together with my family. In the area occupied from Morocco, by Morocco, the population is subject to disappropriation and repression, as has been witnessed by a large number of international organizations. Many Saharis have become victims of violence particularly because of the political commitment. The authorities of Morocco have inundated the territories with thousands of Moroccan settlers, thus pushing the Sahrawi to the margin of the society and turning them to a minority in their own country. In this context, it's important to emphasize that the West Saharan conflict is not an ethnic, religious, or class conflict. It is a conflict, rather, which is of an international character, a political conflict. The West Saharan question is being regarded by the United Nations as the question of decolonization. Since 1963, Western Sahara has been put onto the list of the 17 not self-governed territories and regions that still have to be decolonized. In the late 1980s, King Hassan II of Morocco, in view of the enormous cost of the war for Morocco, he recognized and understood that the military victory in Western Sahara was not to be brought about. We're a small people, but we are invincible. And this is why the two conflict parties, Morocco and Frente Polisario, have accepted a peace plan proposed by the United Nations, which was meant to bring a peaceful solution after 16 years of armed conflict. The settlement plan foresaw a ceasefire which was to be followed by a referendum about the self-determination and self-governing without to be carried out without administrative constraints in order to give the people of Western Sahara to decide between independence or unification with Morocco. To that end, the Security Council in 1991, the Security Council established the MINOSUR, the International Mission for Western Sahara. It was deployed to this region in order to monitor the ceasefire and to organize the referendum for the people in Western Sahara. In January 2000, Minorso managed to 
establish a list of those who are entitled to cast their vote, thus paving the way for the referendum. And at that very point in time, Morocco declared that it was not willing anymore to hold a referendum under the provision set out before. They obviously were afraid that they would lose out during these elections. Twenty years on, on 30th of November 2020, when Morocco violated the ceasefire established in 1991 after having hampered the referendum, the, referenda, the Frente Polisario declared that they were now forced to use their right to self-defense. And as a result of that, they picked up the armed battle for independence again. As a result of that declaration, the Western Sahara has become a zone of open war because the armed conflicts between these two parties alongside the illegal wall within Western Sahara had been continued in a more intensified manner. Why has the Western Saharan question never been solved? You will probably be better to understand that if you take a look at the principle of power determining what is right. So they continue their rule, they, their illegitimate rule, without being punished for it. France is also part of the UN Security Council and is a friend of Morocco. And France and their friends, the European Union and the United States, have been supporting Morocco directly and indirectly. That's the most important reason. The other reason are the continued economic interests of Morocco and its Western partners that is the partners of the capital, and we know how hungry and aggressive capital is, and capitalism is. The occupied Western Sahara is home to one of the largest and highest quality phosphate resources worldwide. And the coastline with a length of 1,400 kilometers has some of the richest fish resources of the world. The territory has a huge potential to generate renewable energies of such a extent that, that it would be able to supply the Maghreb region and even Europe with power. They also have an extraordinarily large potential to produce wind power and solar power, thus also being able to produce green hydrogen. This is why Siemens Energy is one of the main pillars of the strategy of Morocco and Western Sahara, which is the strategy of greenwashing. There are also a lot of German international companies who follow Morocco's strategy in Western Sahara. And this is another obstacle for bringing about a solution in Western Sahara. Marine protein, an importer of fish protein, Tizen Krupp, and Heidelberg, Siemens, Heidelberger Materials are companies who support the settlement policy in Western Sahara through building up the infrastructure. 
Thank you very much for your attention, for listening, for your solidarity with Western Sahara. This solidarity is now more important than ever before. Viva la solidaridad internacional. Long live the solidarity amongst the people. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gina.